So this month's focus is mentoring and we have been through the whole thing and yo under that there is meditation maturity and mentoring so actually it all flows you must be able to meditate daily on the word of god the precepts of god and his commandments and this gospel truth then only you can mature only when you mature then are you only able to mentor others and mentor means guiding or leading means you must go through it then only you can guide others if you have not been through it then how are you to guide others through it so a mentor must be one that is guiding advising and helping the other person and this month's team is mentoring the ing there means is continuous mentoring don't just stop i mentor one person that's it but it's continuous when you're born again you're continuously mentoring your fellow believers you're continuously mentoring those who are yet to believe in this gospel truth okay so this month we will focus more on mentoring and for the first week of this month i've entitled my message as mentorship okay mentorship is similar to discipleship as jesus said or you're shepherding others mentoring requires a relationship requires you to know your stuff and also pass on that stuff for that person to increase in the knowledge of god as well okay and it's not only by changing that person or asking that person to believe in Jesus baptism death and resurrection and that's it that is where your mentoring stops mentoring doesn't stop there that is just the first step of mentoring when that person believes in Jesus baptism death and resurrection that is where the engine starts rolling then your mentoring will increase increase in its level of difficulty so not only bringing them to believe in Jesus baptism death and resurrection but guiding them to hold on to this faith and guiding them to bring them back to God as well until the end when Christ comes back for you or you pass on first with that let us see today's main scripture in 1 Peter 5 verse 1 to 4 it says to the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. So in verse 1, Peter is talking to the elder. In the Amplified Classic it will say pastors or spiritual guides of church. Then some of you might say, I am not a pastor, I am also not a spiritual guy in the church i'm not a leader but those who are born again of just baptism death and resurrection you have brought from the kingdom of darkness to kingdom of light and you're spiritually alive and enlightened then you are a spiritual guide to those who are still in darkness or to those of your fellow believers then you will only refresh one another spirit or else you will only bring deadness if you are walking in the flesh okay so all of us here today are spiritual guides because if you believe that you're born again then you are a spiritual guide okay so peter is relating to us as an elder as the witness of christ suffering and also a sharer of the eternal glory that is going to come so he's relating that to us but let us see what me Peter so bold that he can relate to us as an elder as a sharer of Christ suffering looking he saw Jesus die and he also saw the resurrected Christ Peter okay and what is that full of wisdom that is able to warn and counsel us thereafter in verse 2 to verse 4 so let us rewind back And let us see the journey of Peter. How he started his journey. Let us see in Matthew 4 verse 18 to 20. It says, 
And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. So Peter's job was a fisherman job, daily mending the nets and also throwing the nets, going out to the sea to fish. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. So that is where Peter's journey started. His journey of becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ started there. When Jesus came, came and met him, he says, come, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Instead of a fisherman, I'll make you fishers of men. No longer fishing fish, but fishing men out there. And Peter and his brother, he just throw all and left everything, everything. That is their livelihood, but they left everything and just followed Jesus. That is where he started. And thereafter, you know, Jesus would go one by one and collect his 12 disciples. And Peter personally learned from Jesus himself. After that, we all know that story when Jesus was captured, going to be crucified, what happened? What happened was when the slave girl saw Peter, he says, hey, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. And what did Peter say? I do not know what you are saying. And the second time he went out, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. And Peter responded and denied again, I do not know the man. And thereafter, when he went out of that slave girl, all those people around him say, surely you also are one of them. For your speech betrays you. And the third time he was really annoyed, he said, I do not know this man. And let us see in Matthew 26, verse 75, it says, Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. From a man full with passion, desire and eagerness to leave everything, to come and follow Jesus Christ because of denying Christ because of his flesh, because he wants to save his life, he was changed into someone bitter, guilty. He was thinking to himself, I've wronged God. Jesus Christ, I know he's the Son of God, the Messiah, who said to become coming to this world to save all men. But yet I denied him. And because of that, of the guilt and that condemnation that he had in his heart, he went back to fishing fish, become a fisherman, go back to his old ways. <sighs> I cannot, I cannot serve God anymore. Might as well I just go back to what I used to do. But amazingly, when Jesus resurrected, after Jesus died, he resurrected. In John 21, verse 15 to 17, he says, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than this? More than your fishing career? More than anything? Do you love me more than this? And he said to him, Peter said to Jesus, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And in verse 17, he says, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. 
So three times Peter denied Jesus. In this time, Jesus is asking him back three times as well. In reminder or in reaffirming or assuring him that the first time when I came to you and asked you, follow me, what do you see in me? It's because you acknowledge that I am Christ, that's why you want to follow me. And it's because of your love for God, that's why you want to follow me. So today, Jesus is asking Peter, was that denial stronger or hold more weight than my love for you or your love for me? You know that you love me. And when you first entered the ministry to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, it's because you love Christ and you love God and you love this ministry and you love the people. You want them safe. That is why you came into this ministry. At this juncture, Jesus not only reminds him and reaffirms him, but is giving him an extra. Previously, it was just fishes of men. But now, he's asking him to be a shepherd, to tend and to feed his sheep. The sheep that belongs to Jesus Christ, but he's giving it to Peter to take care of them, to take hold and to guide them and to look for the sheep to look for their shepherd, which is Jesus Christ. Okay? So it's because he has given this great task of ministry to him. That's why today in 1 Peter 5, verse 1 to 4, he can say that as a fellow elders, as a fellow that has suffered and saw what Christ has suffered and that glory that we are all hoping for. So in verse 2, let us read. So be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing. As God wants you to be, not pursuing this honest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Amen. So in this passage, we will learn three qualities of a shepherd. Three qualities that you must have when you are mentoring. Okay? The first one that Peter says is the willingness. Not being forced into to guide others, not being forced into a ministry, but you willingly want to guide others as God wants you to be. Because you have tasted the goodness of God, you willingly want others as well to taste the goodness of God. Okay? So in Colossians 3 verse 23, he says, Whatever may be your task, work at it heartily from the soul, as something done for the Lord and not for men. In this context, it's talking about the master and the slave, or in today, we can say the employer and the employee. It's telling you to work whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. Similarly, in our service, mentoring others in your ministry or in your sphere of your friends, your family, when you're guiding others to know this gospel of God's righteousness, we also must do it unto the Lord. Not because that I'm forced to, that I need to save more so to gain more prizes in heaven. That is not what is motivating you. But what is motivating you is God's love for you. God's love in you that we have learned so much in 1 Corinthians, right? The love of God. The greatest gift is love. The love of God that is overflowing from your heart that you willingly want to share this gospel to see more safe that they can enjoy what you are enjoying today. But the first thing is you must enjoy it. That is why Peter is relating to us because you must go through and believe just baptism, death and resurrection to be safe and to meditate on it daily and mature in this gospel. Then only you can guide others. Guide them 
to where Christ has brought you to be. If you have not walked that journey, it's very hard to guide others to walk that same journey that you have walked. Okay? And willingly to teach and to preach in and out of season. No matter whoever asks you a question, you are willing to teach them, to guide them. Okay? And also willingly to go out, all out for one soul, for the extension of the kingdom of God. All the pittance of this world is nothing. For that one soul, that one soul is more precious to God. Okay? And also willingly to listen. In James 1 verse 19, it says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And thereafter, it will say, because anger does not promote the righteousness of God. Here, I want to focus on quick to listen. Sometimes we are very quick to speak or very quick to want to tell others our agenda that you have in mind. But we are also, we must also be a person who are quick to listen. Without listening to another person or without willingly listening to another person, you wouldn't know how the Holy Spirit is going to lead you throughout that conversation. How are you going to guide them if you do not know another person? If you only speak your agenda, then that it won't be a two-way, it won't be a relationship, and it won't be a mentorship because you're on your side and the other person is far away. But to connect, then you need to listen. Listening is an art that we need to pray that God help us to be a person who is willing to listen to others and not let our flesh take over during that situation. Because sometimes out of our frustration, your flesh rises up. And when your flesh rises up, there won't be anything that will be profitable during that conversation. Okay? So you must let the Holy Spirit to guide you. And also willing to preach the sound doctrine, the totality of the truth, not for the itchiest of what people want to listen. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 3, it says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, instead to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears wants to hear. So, as a born-again elect founded in the gospel truth, you must be willing and be bold to share this gospel. Not to please others, but to set them free. Amen? And the second quality that Peter says is eagerness. You must have that eagerness, that passion, that desire, or in the Amplified Classic, it'll say, eagerness to serve and also cheerfully, eagerly and cheerfully. Means in this ministry, you must enjoy. In the ministry of saving one's soul, you must enjoy that ministry. Okay? And because we know that Christ has first saved us, God was eager to send His Son down for all of us. Because of Adam's sin, all men sin, right? We have fallen short of the glory of God. There's no way else to go back to God's original intent. Last week we have learned. But it's only through Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection. Christ came down eagerly to set us free until the point where He needs to die for all the sin that we have committed, going to commit, and will commit until the day we die. Our last breath itself, maybe at that one second that you're going to die, you still sin. But Christ say, if you believe in Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection, all your sin has been wiped out clean. He sees you as white as snow. Nothing can separate you from the Father. Okay? And... Because Christ is our example, our first mentor, 
for us to go to believe in his gospel. He was a servant himself, so we are too to be eagerly serving his people. Because if you say you have united with Christ, you are one with Christ, Christ serve others humble and serve others, we too humble ourselves and serve our brothers and sisters in Christ. And in Romans 1 verse 14 to 15, it says, both to Greeks and to barbarians, to the cultured and to the uncultured, both to the wise and the foolish, I have an obligation to discharge and a duty to perform and a debt to pay. So for my part, I'm willing and eagerly ready to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. This is Paul saying, I have that burden in me to dispense this gospel until the ends of the world. So I am willing and eagerly ready to share this gospel out. And in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1, it also says that eagerly pursue and seek to acquire this love. Make it your aim, your great quest, and earnestly desire and cultivate the spiritual endowments gift, especially that you may prophesy, interpret the divine will and purpose in inspired preaching and teaching. This we have also learned in 1 Corinthians 14, right? That prophesying means to proclaim and to make known this gospel of God's righteousness. Because only when you proclaim the gospel of God's righteousness, then only one soul can be saved. If you speak in an unknown tongue, in an unknown language, nobody here understands, then how is one going to know and be saved? So only by the knowledge of the word of God, we can be saved. And only when you are eager to share this gospel out, then only one soul can be saved. If you just say, God will send souls in front of me, stand right in front of me and ask me, how are you born again? Then you just need to say, oh, through Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection. And the other person is safe. Then ministry will be very, very easy. Then Paul won't need to write letters after letters after letters after letters. But it's because giving birth to one soul is very, very hard. That is why you need to have that eagerness from Christ. The Holy Spirit himself needs to guide you through, to give you that strength, to give you that passion, that desire to pull you through. And that is why Jesus reminds Peter again and again that your love for me, you must always remember. Your first love, why have you entered into this ministry? How have you been born again? That first love, for Christ and that first love for your ministry for souls must be always in your heart. Then you will always have that passion, that desire, that eagerness to serve the kingdom of God. Amen? And the third one, he says, example. Be an example. Not domineering or lording over others because when Christ came, he didn't say that, how you must serve me because hey, I'm the son of God from the Most High. I came down to this earth to save you, so you must serve me. But no, Christ came to set an example for us to walk. So we too, as a born again elect, we too must set examples for your next generation because this gospel does not only stop in this generation or in your generation. But in the generation thereafter, it must go on and on and on for more souls to be saved. That's why we need to set an example. Okay? And Christ is that perfect example. Even at the point of death, he said, let God's will be done and not mine. And throughout the journey, he says, what my father say, I will say. What my father do, I will do. That is the example that Christ has set before us for us to walk. Okay? And in 1 Timothy 4 verse 12, it says, Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, saying to Timothy, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. 
Ern also has preached about this. So how to remember this acronym? She said, See Christ's love for people. See Christ's love for people. Then you will remember this. When you always remember, I have to see Christ's love for people, then you will remember speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. So that we can set an example for others, for your believers, and for the unbelievers out there. Then only you can make a difference in this world. You can be the salt and the light of this world. Okay? The first one, in speech, let us see in Luke 6 verse 45, it says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. That is why I say you must meditate on the word of God. Because out of the abundance of your heart, whatever you ponder, whatever you think about throughout the whole week, that is what you're going to speak throughout that whole week. And if you believe in Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection, and you meditate on it daily, that is what is going to come out of your mouth. If thanksgiving is what you harbour in your heart daily, then thanksgiving and praise because of Jesus Christ, that will come out of your mouth. And in Proverbs 10 verse 11, it says, The mouth of the uncompromisingly righteous man is a well of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. So how to have a mouth from an uncompromisingly righteous? No man on this world is righteous, right? But only through Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection, you have been made sinless and righteous. Then your mouth is a mouth of an uncompromisingly righteous man. That, it will bring a well of life. That means our mouth, our tongue, is very important. Life and death is in the tongue. So your mouth can be life to one's soul when you share about the gospel of God's righteousness. When you share about how Christ has helped you to conquer in your situation. How have you overcome it in Christ? That will bring life and refreshment to one's spirit and one's soul. Amen? And the second one, it says, be an example in conduct. So in Ephesians 2 verse 10, it says, For we are God's own handiwork, His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand, for us taking path which He prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which He prearranged and made ready for us to live. So in this verse, it says that we are God's workmanship. When you're brought into the kingdom of light, you are God's workmanship. He has prepared the righteous path for you. He has prepared it all for you. The good works, whatever that is in the will of God, God has already prepared that way for you. And you just ought to work in it and work along with Christ to fulfill His will in your journey of life. How do we do that? We must always walk in the Spirit. To walk in the Spirit and to meditate on the Word of God, that is how you walk in the will of God. From the flesh, we can come back to the Spirit just like that. Okay? Then only you can do good works because they say nothing good comes out of the flesh, right? No matter what good you do, what bad you do, it's considered nothing good. But when you walk in the Spirit, you're walking in the will of God, everything is good. That is the good works that God is asking you and calling you to do. Okay? And in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 to 33, it says, So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, but the Jews, Greek, or the church of God. Even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be safe. Means whatever you do, here we're talking about conduct, right? 
Whatever we do, think, will it be a stumbling block for another? Here it says, whether Jews, Greek, or the Church of God, means it comprises everybody in this world. So whatever that you are doing or you're going to do, will that be a stumbling block for another person, a believer or unbeliever, or the people in this church? That is what you need to think when you're mentoring others. Okay, because the word of God says so, and it says that not seeking my own good, but the good of others, so that even they may be safe. It's not worth it because of your conduct, one soul is lost. But we want the other way around, right? Because of what Christ has done in you, that one soul is safe. And that conduct is not by you curbing it or saying, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it anymore. But it's always relying on the Holy Spirit. Relying on what Christ has done for you, knowing that it's through Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection, all has been fulfilled. I just need to walk in the Spirit And then you will clearly know what to do and what not to do, in what situation. Because it also says, we also learn, right? That everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial to you or for another person. Everything on this side of this world, you can do. But will it benefit another person or will it bring down another person? That is for you to consider. That is for you to ruminate and think about it when you are mentoring others or when you're going to mentor others. Okay? And the third one, it says, be example in love. In Matthew 22, verse 33 to 39, it says, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is the first greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Like we have seen, it's God's love. God's love for you and God's love for all mankind because He has already saved all men in this world through just baptism, death and resurrection and nothing else that is needed to be done for them but just to believe in it. So Jesus' love must always be in you. God's love for you and your love for others. That is the greatest commandment of Jesus Christ. The greatest commandment, the greatest law of it all is summed up into these two only. To love God and to love your neighbour as yourself. Okay? And once again, I remind you that it's not in your flesh that you can do this, but only when you walk in the Spirit then you can love others. Then only you can have that compassion towards others. Or else, people will be like passing trees to you. You just walk past them. Ah, They are not worthy of this gospel. But who are you to judge when Christ did not judge you when you first received this gospel? Amen? And the fourth one is, be example in your faith. In your faith, that you have obtained salvation. In 1 Peter 1 verse 9, I didn't give this verse, but it says that because of the faith, you have obtained salvation. Because you believe in Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection, you have obtained the gift of salvation. And with that faith in your heart, let it be made manifest so that others may also look at you and see Christ in you and you'll be an example to them to walk and be bold and to stand firm in this faith as well. And in Hebrews 11 verse 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality, faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. So faith, why is it very important to hold on to this faith 
from the beginning to the end because that faith is your assurance. Because of this faith, you have the seal of the Holy Spirit. Without the faith in God's, the gospel of God's righteousness, his baptism, death and resurrection, you don't have the seal of the Holy Spirit. You don't have that assurance to go back to Christ. And faith is something that you cannot see. But you are very certain, like it, it has appeared to you in real form. That is what he's saying faith is like. Okay, and in Hebrews 11 verse 6, it says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So that faith is very important for people to emulate or imitate. Because without that faith, you are not united with Christ. And without Christ, how can you expect people to imitate you? Because even Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So because he has imitated Christ, then he has that bonus to say, imitate me as well. Okay? And the fifth one, the last one, be an example in purity. In Matthew 5 verse 8, it says, Blessed, happy, and viable, fortunate, and spiritually prosperous, possessing the happiness produced by the experience of God's favour and especially conditioned by the revelation of His grace, regardless of their outward condition. So blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Only those who are pure in heart can see God. And how have you been made pure in heart? Only through uniting with Jesus at His baptism, all my sin has been passed unto the body of Jesus, dying with Him and rising up together with Christ. Then you have that purity of heart. With that purity of heart, knowing that you're sinless and righteous, then you can see God. And God can hear you, He can see you, and you are His child. And nothing will ever separate you from Christ or from God anymore. And in Psalms 119 verse 9, it says, How can a young man stay on the path of purity? The answer is by living according to your word. So in the Amplified Classic Version, it says, How shall a young man cleanse his way? In the NIV, it just says, Living according to your word. Sometimes we don't really understand what does it mean by living according to your word. But in the Amplified, it says, By taking heed and keeping watch, on himself according to your word, conforming his life to it. Means patterning your life with the word of God. Not you trying to change the word of God and live according to your way. But the word of God is supposed to change the way you live. That is what he's talking about. Then only can a young person stay on the path of purity. Okay, so only through meditating, maturing, we can mentor others. And mentoring doesn't stop there only. This whole month, we will see what God has for us this month of mentoring. And how can we mentor others, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who are growing in this gospel and the people out there, the lost sheep. That God says, you're the shepherd to the shepherdless. Like how Jesus is a shepherd to the shepherdless, you too must act as a shepherd to them, to bring them into the sheepfold. Okay? And in 1 Peter 5 verse 4, how it ends is, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. That is the reward that I think every apostle, even Paul, Peter, in every book that you, you read, it will always end with this. The hope of glory that is soon to come, that is going to come, that is the hope that you place your faith in. That crown 
of glory that will never fade away. 